Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to start because we want to make sure that uh, we do the best of the time that we have, and we have amazing speakers here. But uh, before Barjan introduces the session and all our speakers, I want to uh, remind everyone what we're doing. Uh, this is the the uh, this is the second time that basically we're, we're convening the school and beyond the school to to reflect on what is happening in the world after affirmations that helped us. Uh, uh, to set what are the areas where the school is working and what are the interlocutions that we are having with other fields, and not only with other academic fields, but also with activism, professions, uh, uh, sensitivities, communities. Uh, we feel that we felt, and that was something that we discussed with many of the people who participated last year, that it's the moment of also thinking how we action things, how we action change. What is the way that our fields can work together with others to action in change. And we've identified eight topics or eight methodological shifts, we'd say, or, or challenges that we have to address. And yes, like in the previous, in the first summit, we were addressing what is the way that we can work collectively, what it means to work collectively when also the collective is not only people, it's much more complex than that. And in this second, we're basically questioning what is the way that we can be reactive? What is the way that we can uh, accelerate uh, our impact on uh, urgent challenges. And in each session, we're not only asking uh, methodologically, but also situating that question on a specific area of urgency. And this one is about the housing crisis. We have amazing, the amazing opportunity to bring together people that have been moving from activism to politics, designers, people that are working on inventive ways for real estate to be subversive and, and alternative and, and working uh, in New York and, and in different parts to respond to this question, how we uh, action uh, change in a way that can speed up and react to urgencies. And this is uh, a conversation. That's why we're also uh, challenging the, the format of the podium and all these things. So I would ask everyone here to feel that there's no divide between who's responding, who's asking, who's speaking, presenting. Take notes, and we will have a conversation after the presentations. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, please. Thank you, Andres. Um, so good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, and welcome, all of you, to what is now the second Actioning Summit. And I want to especially welcome our esteemed guests tonight, uh, Carlos Baiges, Ara Colau, Renato Simbalista and Varika Williams. Um, and of course, also welcome to our interlocutors, um, our respondents, Juan Herreros, um, Adam Lubinsky, Tom Slater, and Hilary Sample. Um, and I want to welcome everyone who is watching online. As always, there are many of you watching from around the planet. Uh, my name is Bartjan Polman. I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Public Programming um, here at GSAP. So tonight, with this Actioning Summit, um, as was already mentioned, we'll continue our challenge to existing formats and bring together a wide range of voices to discuss together um, the built environment. Um, and a few words about this format for those of you who are new. Um, as tonight um, is a project of eight, um, and what it is aimed at uh, with this actioning summit, as was mentioned, is really the, the how, the specific methodologies, specific knowledge that led to real, tangible outcomes. And after our last discussion during the first actioning summit, which focused on how to work collectively now, um, we will move our focus to the question of how to respond to the eviction and housing crisis, and we'll do so by looking at the incredibly important work um, done by our four speakers um, in the creation of affordable housing. Housing. Um, as I'm sure we will see, uh, whether through activism, community organizing, policy making or design, or more likely through a combination of all of those, um, what we want to discuss here tonight are the very specific knowledge and specific methodologies that have led to the actual creation of affordable housing in quite different geographical contexts. Um, so just a few words about how the evening um, will unfold. We will first hear from the four speakers, starting with Renata, uh, Renato, uh, then Ada, then Barika um, and then Carlos, um, they will each speak for about 15 minutes about their incredible work. Um, and after the four presentations, we'll hear targeted questions from our respondents, um, and we will then open it up to, to conversation and questions. Um, and because we have so many speakers tonight, um, we will try to keep a strict control of the time, and I want to introduce 
MH who is sitting there um, who has a flag that will be raised once the time is up. So after your 15 minutes, um, keep an eye out uh, for that. So please conclude if you see the flag. Um, and um, because of that, I will also keep the introduction of the speakers very short. So no offense, but you can find their incredible biographies um, easily in detail online. So our first speaker sitting right there will be Renato, Renato Simbalista, who is an architect and planner and professor of the School of Architecture, Urbanism and Design at the University of Sao Paulo. He's one of the directors of FICA, the first uh, anti-gentrification real estate fund in Brazil. So Renato's presentation will be followed by Ada Calau, um, who served as the first female mayor in Barcelona from 2015 until 2023. And she has dedicated much of her career um, to social and human rights activism, feminism, solidarity, and the promotion of diversity have always played a central role in our municipal policies, um, through which she has focused on the fight against inequalities, the right to decent housing, and the strengthening of citizen participation. Uh, we will then hear from Barika Williams, who is the Executive Director of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. Um, and ANHD is a leading uh, nonprofit focused on creating housing and economic justice for all New Yorkers. She's a leader and a national voice on how community development in marginalized neighborhoods can advance racial justice, and has pioneered novel projects and published on topics including affordable housing practices, foreclosure prevention, um, and the links between health, education, and housing. Lastly then, we will hear from Carlos Baigas Cambrui, who is an architect uh, and one of the founding members of the cooperative La Col. And La Col's important work has been uh, exhibited extensively uh, and has been awarded several recognitions, uh, La Borda uh, especially, including the, the Mies van der Rohe Award in 2022. Um, and then our interlocutors, Tom Slater um, is a professor here at GSEP and the director of the PhD in urban, in urban planning, um, an author of six books and over 75 scholarly articles. Um, he works on a range of urban issues, including gentrification and displacement and housing justice movements. Uh, Juan Herreros um, is a professor of professional practice here at GSEP with over five, 35 years of professional experience um, and most recently with the studio, uh, studio Herreros, of course. Um, Hilary Sample is the IDC Foundation Professor of Housing Design and the coordinator of the core studios here at GSEP and co-founder of the New York-based architecture and design studio Moss. And Adam Lubinsky uh, is an associate professor of professional practice at Columbia GSEP um, and the interim director of the real estate program and a managing principal at uh, WXI Architecture and Urban Design. Um, so with that, this summit is officially open. And Renato, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank very much Patian and Andres for inviting me to this uh, amazing program. And uh, it makes me super honored and uh, also it makes me super honored to be together with Marika, Carlos and Ada. Uh, and uh, I could not agree more with the idea that we need to discuss how things are done, uh, which ways, techniques, protocols should we use in our struggles for better cities and better spaces. I come from Sao Paulo, a mega city of 20 million inhabitants, the largest in South America. The municipality of Sao Paulo has around 3 million houses. Housing shortage in Sao Paulo is around 400,000 housing units, and there are 588,000 vacant houses in the city according to the 2022 census. In order to address these kinds of issues such as vacancies, uh, gentrification, the vixen, and so on. Uh, in 2015, a group of people, like a very small group of people, uh, started to organize themselves. Uh, I was uh, part of it, and we wanted, uh, we asked ourselves, instead of cursing speculation, uh, instead of cursing uh, private property, why don't we uh, create non-speculative property? This was the uh, triggering of uh, our association that uh, was founded in 2015. It's called the Community Property Association and it runs FICA, which is uh, the acronym for Fundo Immobiliario Comunitario para Aluguel, which means Community Real Estate Fund, and it means also to stay in uh, Portuguese. Uh, when we started, we had nothing. Uh, we had probably less money than 
you would have in your pockets if you still carried money with you. It was really, we started from uh, scratch. And I'm really proud to say that nine years on, we have 11 pieces of real estate. We have 50 apartments and saved around uh, 1,400 square meters from uh, speculation. And uh, today, this very day, more than 90 people will live in a safe house due to our work. I, it makes me really pr proud and quite moved every time that I uh, say these figures because uh, if we were not like switching the on button nine years ago, uh, this uh, would not be happening and these 90 people probably would be homeless, we don't, don't, would not have uh, good and safe uh, places uh, where to live. So that may be my first answer to this uh, uh, question that we have addressed, uh, which is how to uh, face uh, housing crisis. I think uh, we, uh, if everybody switched the on button, stopping talking about uh, situations, talking about the situation will not, not solve the situation, but action will solve the situation, or not solve, but uh, improve uh, situations. I really, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really happy that we did this on button switching nine years ago. FICA charges from zero to around 40% of market prices of a rent. By the way, we have zero uh, money of uh, government. We have zero subsidies. We would love to have subsidies. Indeed, government likes us, but they didn't carve the proper policies for uh, us uh, to fit, because it's like a social landlord or social owner. It's something that's it's not traditional to our uh, housing policies that are very based upon private property, so in, and government has been quite slow in adapting to us, but they will. Uh, in countries such as the Netherlands, where uh, social landlordship uh, is more common, the first housing cooperatives and housing associations, they appeared in 1850, and it took like 60 or 70 years before government looked at them and said, okay, this is a good model, let's try to insert it in public policies, so that we are not in a hurry, in the proper time, we think uh, that the uh, government will understand that this is a viable model, not for solving every housing problem, but for solving some housing problems. By the way, every society that has said that they have solved uh, their housing problems was committing something very bad, genocides and so on. This is the kind of thing that can be like not solved, but re, re equationated I'm not sure if this is the, uh, 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 this is the word. When we started, uh, we were totally voluntary, and now we have a professional and multidisciplinary team, architecture, engineering, psychology, social work, law, and so on. Uh, I'm the only voluntary uh, worker because I'm a full-time professor in the University of Sao Paulo, so that uh, this is, uh, it, it's very difficult for me to, to uh, in, indeed I pay for making all this work that I'm sharing with you, and I'm quite happy to do this because I understand this as part of my like giving back to the society. I work in a public university that pays for my money, pays for my pension, and uh, I like to give me back that way. And, uh, but uh, apart from me, all our team is uh, professional then, and we are really happy uh, about it. I can talk uh, for many hours about our achievements in FICA and also about our challenges and plans. Uh, I could talk about the amazing effects of safe housing in the lives of people, in the health of people, in the security, in children's lives, in children's uh, uh, life uh, in schools, and so on. Uh, I could talk, uh, and I really like the subject, about how we are innovating our uh, contracts to deal with, with a new social actor, which is the social landlord that uh, we describe ourselves as. Uh, like this, and uh, we are interpreting our regulations so that we can make contracts in which we fit. And it's possible, combining different instruments. And uh, I could talk about the way, uh, how we interpret the history of our houses. For example, the research and, ex and exhibition that we have done in the Anyaya apartment that we is recently opened in the working class neighborhood of Bon Retiro. We just got ready the renovation of the flat and we activate the space for some months before we rent it. We bring our sponsors and allied people to know the space and the careful renovation that we have done here and we exhibit the history of the flat. And this is not like a, a, a minor subject. We want people to be engaged and we want to people to uh, understand how we honor the stories of the people that have occupied this land 
and first the river, then the Guarani people, then the Portuguese uh, king declared himself, he owned this land, and then a bunch of Portuguese wealthy people, they got the, the land as a favor from the Portuguese government, then an Alsatian, then an Italian family, then a Jewish family, then another Jewish family, and finally ourselves. Yeah, especially Noemi's story, who lived 60 years in this apartment. She came as a live-in maid to live with a family when she was 15 years old, and she lived in this apartment for 60 years, until she was 80 years old when she died, and she died in this apartment. She survived everybody, all the family either left or died and stayed in the apartment. We like to tell all these stories, and it's super important to the family that so does the apartment for a very, very slow, low price that they keep us, uh, they, they, that they are engaged and they like uh, to hear this story. People ask us, are you painting the facade? And we say, no, on the opposite, we are interpreting the facade. We are honoring also the people that are doing graffitis here, which is quite difficult. I cannot read these signs because uh, the groups that are writing here are not just writing their signature, but each one has its own alphabet. This is the kind of stuff that we can do when uh, you uh, deal with uh, social property. Uh, I could talk about the groups that we are inspiring, like Aja in Campinas. It's a totally uh, independent group, but we have incubated them. We have uh, incubated, in including financially, they started uh, the uh, donations that they get for the NGO in our banking account. We shared with them all our contracts, models, and social technologies, and now uh, last month they have opened this house for 12 people, and we are really very, very uh, happy that we are enabling and they are doing it much quicker than ourselves because we have done lots of the hard job. It's super nice. It means social property. Uh, I'm to totally together with uh, people like Henry George or Ebenezer Howard that uh, understand that the private speculative property is the origins of many, many evils in our society. And if we carve out what we call social property, non-speculative property, we can unveil a whole world uh, of possibilities of inspiring situations and turning energy that's normally bad energy into energy that can be good, virtuous energy, cooperative, collaborative uh, energy. We really, really enjoy and every day we are discovering new ways, new lenses from which we can talk to society from our point of view, which is non-speculative uh, property, taking property out. Uh, of the market. But the subject I want to get a little bit into it is uh, 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 building uh, ma maintenance. Am I right, Flavia? I was taught uh, yesterday uh, that uh, I should not say maintenance, but maintenance. I have tried to say maintenance here. Thank you, Flavia, so much. And after some uh, thinking about the invitation that Patian uh, asked me to choose a specific topic of our work and explore the how techniques, methods, instruments that we use, we decided to talk about this subject, maintenance, that is considered a minor subject. I hope it makes sense to this audience. For Brazilian reality, it makes a lot of sense. Because in Brazil, an average architect does not really know how building maintenance works. I'm not, I'm not sure about the situation here. I'm really curious about it. I never really made a structured presentation on this issue, but I think we have some insights to share with you here. Academics and artists freak out about the 50,000 new homes the real estate market produces every year in our city. But we keep quite silent about how the 5 million existing houses in the city are maintained, are janitored. I googled it, I googled scholars it, and curiosity about building maintenance and building janitoring by academics and even by activists is really small. Uh, and I think it's really strange. After all, in this precise moment, just 1% of the city is being built, while the other 99% of the city, and I think it must be the same in this city here, is being maintained. It has to be cleaned, swept, lamps have to be replaced. Thousands of people are involved in this work. Cleaners, janitors, supervisors, electricians, tenants. Don't we have anything to learn from all these people? Isn't it valuable knowledge? In my city, there are two basic ways of maintaining buildings that I'm showing in the screen. For the few who have the money, there is paying and contracting, hiring people, and this costs a lot of money. 
most people who cannot afford to do the maintenance, uh, they do it for, for themselves, mm, very like uh, 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 do-it-yourself uh, ways. In Sao Paulo, at least, there is a strong correlation between good or bad maintenance in the inside of the building and in the outside of the building. The micro-political actors that decide how a building will be cleaned, swept, how the lamps will be changed, are precisely the same social actors that will decide if a leaking roof will be fixed or not, or cannot, for lack of money, if a facade will be renovated, or if it cannot be renovated for lack of resources, so that inside and outside are very correlated. Urban decay has lots to do with difficulties with janitoring, with cleaning, with maintenance, and uh, so on. It's even related to climate change. In the long term, how a building is maintained defines if people will stay or leave. And everyone here in this room knows of stories of buildings that decayed to a point that renovating would be more expensive than demolishing. If these buildings have been well maintained over the decades, they would have probably survived. And we know that the building industry is the largest contributor to greenhouse gases around 37% of greenhouse gases are produced by the building industry. And also from a labor point of view, better maintenance is more redistributive than building a new. Building industries concentrated, capital intensive, financialized, whereas maintenance industry is much more democratic and can be run by small enterprises, by family, families, by immigrants and uh, so on. For FICA, our organization, the subject of janitoring and maintenance became more important as we grew and had more houses. If we accepted the solutions given by the market, we have very high building costs. On the other hand, simply telling the tenants that they should take care of the building was not an option. It's not an option. We want to take care of our buildings. We want them to be always in excellent conditions but we want to share this responsibility with the tenants and make this as affordable as, 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 affordable as possible. In other words, we want to challenge <clears throat> the idea that excellent building maintenance is just for rich people, which is what prevails in Brazil. We still don't have an answer for that, but in one of our buildings we have an experience that I think is worth sharing. This is the Caburé building, one wealthy family bought the building and gave it to FICA for 15 years last year. It's a long story and I think I don't have the time uh, to do it. It has 20 apartments. We rent the apartments for low-income students of the University of Sao Paulo, which is short walking distance from the house. 15,000 students from the University of Sao Paulo get social support from the university and we kind of plugged in this policy and just people that are enrolled in this policy can live uh, in uh, Caburé. They get the best university in Brazil for free, three meals a day for free, sports facilities, social support, on top of it, uh, 800 reais of financial support from the university. But biggest pain is housing, which is incredibly expensive. Uh, our Caburé building is by far the most affordable housing in the immediate surroundings of the campus. Uh, it costs around 115 US dollars. Uh, and this housing would cost uh, easily three times as much in the market. There's nothing like this if we consider the quality of housing, the open spaces, the small distance to university, uh, uh, self-determination, it's not controlled space, you can, take, you can bring visits, you can build your own rules to a certain extent, and we think that just a social landlord could provide this, not market landlords can never uh, provide this kind uh, of uh, quality. When we got the building, we got anxious, and different from other buildings of FICA, this building has a big amount of open spaces, decks, staircases, garden, community room, laundry, three common washing machines, and, oh, no time anymore, so I'll, I'll hurry. And then we hired our uh, pioneers, and uh, 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 these are students that, uh, uh, we invited first that were close to us and started to bring in a new uh, technology. We have a game, it's here, that uh, we play so that uh, we can build the first rules, first living rules of uh, the house. Then we started to decoup, uh, to desiccate janitoring in 
uh, the smallest, uh, in the smallest units uh, possible, uh, like uh, sweeping and uh, so on. Uh, we made uh, this kind of cards. We have some of these cards here. We wanted to desiccate janitoring and maintenance as much as a biologist desiccates uh, an uh, organism. Uh, we made a board out of it. This is Eduardo, the student that helped us doing this. I'm quite happy that uh, in our uh, building, when people visit, they take picture of this uh, board uh, about taking care of uh, the... Uh, uh, of the building, it means that we were successful in making it cool. Then we made a uh, assembly about deliberating over maintenance, and people chose what they want to maintain, how they want to maintain the preferred uh, activities about uh, maintenance. Then six months afterwards, we are monitoring it, and people think it's good uh, the way that we are maintaining, uh, and then. In September 2024, this is last week, we are sharing results and planning the next steps. Uh, building our building is super nicely uh, taken care of. Everybody knows what uh, they want to do. We are uh, uh, making sharing the risks of uh, 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 maintenance to, uh, with the students, and people are really happy about it. And I'll be happy to talk a little bit about it. And well, this is some of the panels that we are building in the building. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Renato. In, in the meantime, I also want to invite people standing in the back. There are some more seats in front. Feel, please, uh, feel free to, to grab a seat. Um, next up, we'll hear from Ara Colau. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be here today, and thank you for this kind invitation. I'm so sorry because uh, my English is so bad, but I'm going to try it, okay? And, and, and love me and help me if I can find the right word, okay? <laughs> um, first of all, I, I want to take a few seconds, only a few seconds, to thank all the students who have been demonstration, uh, demonstrating for weeks in this university and other universities to call for a ceasefire and for the American government to stop supporting and sending weapons to the genocidal Netanyahu's government. Thank you also to Jewish Voice for Peace here in New York and their powerful message of hope as a woman, as a mother that believes in peace and human rights, thank you, and free Palestine. So, in this summit, uh, we talk about how to speed up the response to urgent crises like evictions and housing crises. Today, just today, uh, we can read in, the, in, in a Spanish newspaper that a court of law has filed another complaint against me and our government in Barcelona for stopping an eviction of a vulnerable family. In fact, in recent years, 20 complaints against us and our politics have already been closed. That's lawful. You know, I think that's lawfare. In Brazil, knows very well <laughs> lawfare. And the lawfare and the bias that the elites and some big corporations, for example, real estate, have for wanting the maximum benefit without limits. But lawfare in Barcelona does not, does not uh, scare us. On the contrary. It reaffirms us. We will continue to defend the right to housing until it becomes a reality in our cities. With this introduction, you can understand better, I think, who I am. I am not only the first woman mayor of Barcelona. I'm also the first woman mayor bisexual, of working class, and with an, uh, a long activist background. All this has happened for the first time 
in a, in a place of power and visibility, such as the mayor's office of Barcelona, where we were not expected, common people were not expected in the office mayor of Barcelona. And this information, I think, is important to understand the policies that we have made in Barcelona the last eight years, especially in housing. In Barcelona, we have been able to make new policies, which had never been done before, because we had a different background than the previous governments. We have been able to do things that when we were, when me, for example, and others of my government, when we were activists and we proposed them to the public administration in Barcelona, um, they told us, impossible, this, this is impossible, absolutely impossible. For example, uh, a local policy to stop evictions or a local policy to promote housing cooperatives throughout the city. And we activists no, in, 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 in the past asked, why is it impossible? And always they say, it, because the evictions are the competence of state laws, or because there is not enough land or money to make housing cooperatives or social housing. However, eight years later, we did it. It has not been easy. Uh, we have faced many difficulties, such as lawfare, for example, or the resistance of technostructure and bureaucracy of public sector. But you can imagine the satisfaction it gives to have today more than a thousand cooperative apartments in Barcelona. And remember that 10 years ago, they told us that it was, was completely impossible. It's nice, it's really nice. The housing crisis is structural and we need, I think, one strategy, but many solutions. There is no single magic solution for housing crisis. Context in Spain is a disaster. Now I have no time to explain all the history of, of the context in Spain, but it's a disaster. Only 1% of the total housing stock is social housing, for example. The state and, and the regional governments hold the majority of competences and budget in housing. So what can a city do? We have some instruments. For example, we have social policies, we have urban planning regulation, we have a small budget, but a budget, and we have a lot of creativity, we have a lot of innovation, desire, and we can cooperate with citizens and social, social movements. In fact, in eight years, we have built more social housing than ever, and, and more social housing than the national state and regional government. We have, for example, uh, find uh, vulture fund, funds that have treated their tenants badly. We have confronted Airbnb, and we have closed thousands and thousands of illegal tourist apartments. We have innovated with new forms, for example, of construction, uh, for example, with recycled shipping containers. We have created social housing with industrial modules with the high, highest uh, quality in a few months, because you know constructing a traditional building takes minimum of two years, while building a structure with these industrial modules only takes six months. So it's very important, the question of time when you, when you have a crisis. No? Okay, in ten, in 10 minutes, I can't explain all the housing policies we have done in Barcelona. So I chose only two examples of policies that we were told were impossible and now are a reality. First, uh, I want to talk about a new public service to stop evictions, 
we learn uh, from social movements. It's true that uh, evictions are not competence, legal competence, responsibility of the city council. This is true. Um, it's national state who have the responsibility in the laws and regulations about housing and evictions. But evictions do happen in our city. And we must act to protect our population. If the social movements without money, without legal competences, if the social movements have been able to stop evictions and force the banks to negotiate, I think that the City Council of Barcelona that have a budget and public workers and resources must also be able to do so. How we did it? Uh, City Council made a public agreement, made a public and transparent agreement with a social company to coordinate social workers to advise, negotiate and mediate in all cases of eviction of vulnerable people who ask for help from the City Council. This is a free service that has managed to stop thousands of evictions and negotiate uh, with the property alternative solutions such, for example, such as social renting. If the owner accept lower the price and make social rent, the municipality offers to guarantee that the owner of the apartment will collect the rent. This is one example of a new service that didn't exist. Another example, to use uh, urban planning regulation to change the relationship between the public sector and private sector. I think this is a very important point to change this relationship. Before, the relationship was the public sector gives urban land to the private sector, and the private sector builds housing and makes a big, big, enormous business. It's crazy, I think. The city's most precious treasure, the urban land, cannot be privatized. So we change some rules in, in these eight years. We change the rules and we based the new rules in co-responsibility and public leadership. Because if housing is a human right, it's not correct that the private sector does business as if they were luxury watches. No, you can speculate maybe with luxury watches, but you don't need um, luxury watches to live in the city but you need houses, no? So is the, it, it's, it's not the same thing, it's obvious. So we say to real estate, you can, okay, you can do business with housing, but with limits. It's a little change, no? With limits and public land and public housing will never be privatized again in Barcelona. This change forever. One example of a new regulation. In Spanish, uh, we call it uh, tanteo y retracto. I don't know in English, but I explain what's, what's tanteo y retracto. It means that the city council has the right to purchase each building that is put up for sale in the city. It is a housing purchasing strategy to expand the public housing stock but it also allows to have social housing in central locations. And this is very important, to achieve mixed neighborhoods and not ghettos with only, only social housing in the periphery, like Paris, no? for example, the Valliers. No? We, don't, we don't want this. We want uh, mixed um, neighborhoods and we want social housing in every neighborhood. Another very important example to change the relationship between public and private sector is to promote housing cooperatives. But Carlos, 
uh, later will explain it. So. Um, we also have to recognize the limits. It's, all of this, it was difficult, it's, it's not easy. Um, many laws and resources and budgets depends on national governments. A city council cannot do everything without the complicity of national government. But it's also true that if in Barcelona we can do things that we were told were impossible, it shows that if national governments had the political will, we could, could solve the, the housing crisis, if you scale the level. No? Finally, I, I think key issue is two concepts or, or two ideas in, this, in these policies. No? First, we have to change the paradigm. Housing cannot be a commodity. It is a human right. So we must review the laws, we must review the budgets, we must review the relationship with the private sector. We have to promote new social actors, such as cooperatives. Uh, taxation must be reviewed to punish speculation. And second, uh, we need a lot of innovation, creativity, courage. It is impossible to solve a structural problem with old solutions. It's impossible. We need new institutions. We need more sustainable and diverse forms of tenure and to strongly punish all wheelchair funds and speculators that put in danger our lives in our cities. We need new ideas. So here I invite you to create solutions and to have and create new ideas because this is an university, so <laughs> this is the perfect place. Because, and, and, and I finish with this idea, um, we live in a city and the, most, the majority of population in the world lives in a city, but what is a city? City is not buildings, not streets, avenues, museums, universities, schools, all of this is important. But city, first of all, is people, is human beings. If you think in a city without people, without citizens, you can see a desert, a dystopia, <laughs> not a city. City needs lives. And, and for, for citizens, it's needs, citizens need house to live in the cities. So if we want to guarantee the right to the city, we have to defend housing rights. It's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. Uh, next, Varika, please. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Barika Williams. I'm the executive director of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. Everybody only knows us by our initials. Um, and I am your local person from right here in New York City. Um, I just want to say up front thank you to Andres, to Bart, um, and to Adam and others for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, so a &A, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization which actually connects is actually quite complicated because as they talk, I want to change what I say, but I'm going to try to stick to what um, I had planned. Um, but we are a 50-year-old uh, nonprofit here in New York City, and we are a community development trade association. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. Um, but our purpose and our mission is to build community power um, in order to win um, affordable housing and equitable neighborhoods throughout New York City. Um, what makes us a little bit of a different structure is we don't build the buildings, we don't own the buildings, we don't maintain the buildings, we're not, we're not on the ground. We ourselves, ANHD, are, went from our original eight, kind of like Renatos, um, folks who were like in their neighborhoods and said we want something different for our local community. The original eight of those organizations across New York City 
um, formed us um, because they were operating in their very different neighborhoods and contexts. And over time, we have now grown to 80 plus neighborhood um, organizations across New York City. So these are the folks who are like on the ground in your neighborhood. You can become a community member of them. They, they are operating. We've got our oldest community development corporation in the country in this group. We've got um, New York City's oldest community land trust. We've got New York City's oldest cooperative building in this group. Um, so kind of span the full city, and we are a bit their backbone, uh, the back of the house that has to do a little bit of everything. Um, and we are a member-led and driven organization. So our board consists of representatives of our members. They are the ones that guide the work that we do. Um, so that is who we are accountable to. Uh, and that's how we think about staying rooted in what is happening on the ground and in really New York City's like most marginalized immigrant, people of color, um, low-income communities across the city. Uh, what we do is combine sort of three different pieces. Um, so we think about this um, understanding that we need to un think about the policy and research side of this. Um, so we do a lot of data analysis, we do a lot of numbers, we do a lot of digging into best practices, um, which is why it's always amazing to be in a room like this. Um, we also combine that with capacity building um, for the movement. We are a lot of times their technical assistance arm, so we're training folks on new laws. You have to um, implement new requirements around sustainability and greening your buildings and right, who is going to, once the city passes that law, once the state passes that law, tell you as like the nonprofit, here is how you can actually operationalize that. Where can you find the money to do that? So we do a lot of that. Um, and then organizing and advocacy. So we deeply believe in community organizing. We have community organizers on our staff. We work with them day in and day out. Um, we run campaigns and coalitions, join campaigns and coalitions, um, and bring that all together for what we see as holistic movement building. So that's how we approach this work. And I'd be remiss to say we are a small but growing team, and we do all of this with a team of about 15 to 20 people on a consistent basis. Um, so what I want to talk about more so today, because Bart and Andres' task was like focus on just one thing, which is quite hard um, to Ada's point. Um, it's, it's easy to, there is a lot happening, and it's hard to think about the context of this. But um, actually, it was funny. Um, I think Renato said it. Um, uh, um, a right to stay is one of the ways that we sort of frame this, um, and specifically thinking about how we're resisting the displacement of color and culture from New York City, as we see a very changing dynamic of what New York City looks like, who can access it, um, and who really feels like they have a place to stay here. I'm specifically going to talk about this around housing, but just note that also we do this work as tied to small businesses and preventing small business displacement as we think about jobs, um, and as we think about our manufacturing sector, which feels like a funny one to say, but is disproportionately our highest paid jobs for folks who do not earn above a high school education. Um, so as we displace those jobs, we also displace their ability to stay in the city over the long term. Um, uh, um, Ada cued me up perfectly, um, because this is about people, and so I want to talk start out um, with like grounding um, in Senor Felipe, which is one of our um, local um, tenant leaders who was working on this. Um, and he had lived in his neighborhood for um, 34 years, uh, um, was going through something that we call construction as harassment, where his landlord was basically trying to push him out by not fixing things, rehabbing things, ultimately for Senor Felipe, they was, um, uh, uh, redid the roof while they were still living there, told them they needed to leave, um, said, you will be able to access your unit. They came back home, doors were locked, all their stuff was inside, and had to, for a family that potentially has a lot of vulnerability, interact with the police in order to get their valuables out of their home that they then never were able to come back to, right? Um, and this is the kind of um, displacement, the gentrification, um, the evictions. Also, sometimes we think of evictions as like only the legal process, but there are lots of informal ways people get evicted out of their homes and spaces um, that happens in New York City every day. Um, I always like to talk about, and since this is a, a university, uh, it's good to remind and push um, that our housing, our neighborhoods, and our built environment here, especially here in New York City, but really throughout the US, 
are products um, of systemic and structural racism designed to marginalize communities and oppress. Um, and if you want to understand, especially for those who are not New Yorkers, and I'm gonna ask everybody to shout out an answer because I'm used to tenant leaders where we go back and forth. Um, uh, this is a older map of New York City. The different dots um, are population by race. Um, can somebody give me what the green dot is? Who said it? There you go, white. Blue dot? Somebody? Black? Orange? Mm, it's got a little murky here. Somebody? Hispanic, Latino, and red? Asian, right? So this is like the fact that you can look at this map and pretty clearly be able to tell who's who in New York City. This is dated. We are interested to see what this looks like now post-COVID because this is pre-COVID. Um, but to show just how geographic, how racially divided we are as a, as a city, right? Um, and this very much ties back to our systems and structures. So let's go here, down in the bottom where you see all that blue and the green, that's part of Brooklyn. Zoom in, this is the redlining map, the actual real redlining map um, of Brooklyn that was issued by um, our federal government that told where you were or were not supposed to give loans and mortgages to families by race. So red areas were mainly for people of color, and then you sort of go out in order of what is more allowed and less allowed. Amazing exhibit, Undesign the Red Line by Designing the We, if you ever have a chance to, to catch it. Um, it was actually housed here not uh, about a year or two ago. Um, so actually, come to think of it, this is the picture on the left is at Columbia. Um, so yeah, it, you can see how much these two things connect um, and how much the policy patterns that we created, that were created by government, sanctioned by government, are still shaping the patterns of where people live and where they can feel like they can and, um, and have the choice to live. We come back to this a lot because oftentimes in conversations, especially with real estate, um, and for those who are not familiar with the New York City context, you know, combine in other places, it's pharma, or it's um, it's uh, um, it's the um, sorry the the um, car manufacturers are right. Everybody has that place that's like their big industry in New York. It's real estate. That is our big industry, um, and we will also often hear the pushback of like it's choice and people are making, but you can tell that it seems pretty difficult that nobody would ever choose to break a part of these patterns. Um, and for us, this becomes a big issue because ultimately we talk about displacement and gentrification coming down to a difference between choice and versus access and power. Um, and when you don't have the power to make choice, then you are being displaced, right? That that is a different thing. Uh, you don't control, but you have things happen to you. Okay, so let me make sure I jump in. Um, okay, so where are we now? News flash, spoiler alert, we're in a crazy housing crisis here in New York City. Um, rents have increased 45% since 2010. Um, these don't exactly overlap because the other one is like 2000 to now 2024, another seven times. So basically we're at least at 40% in like a, um, uh, in a seven-ish year range. Um, and basically our, for all intents and purposes, our vacancy rate in New York City is, is null and void. We have about a 1.5% housing vacancy, which mainly means we have no space. Um, it also trickles into our homelessness population. There are about 150,000 people who are homeless on any given day, and that includes 100 plus thousand children as recorded by our own Department of Education. So, um, thinking about one solution, and I will say, we have some, uh, um, Otto, what you mentioned, we call first right of refusal here when you were like, I don't know how to translate it. So we have done a bunch of different ways that we try to think about and tackle creating right to stay. Coming from the tenant side, coming from the building side, right? So rent stabilization, predatory equity, certificate of no harassment, right to counsel, first look, first right of refusal, accessory dwelling units, community land trusts, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, Joe, which is a nonprofit REIT, and the Displacement Alert Project. That's just a few. 
I'm going to talk specifically about one because that was my task. Um, and so specifically thinking about how do we get ahead of shaping all the new development that happens, right? We've done so much work to say, like, once somebody's there, how do we keep them? We were like, how do we start to get on the front end of this? Um, and this is what happens. This is three different buildings basically all on the same street um, on Atlantic Avenue. So you're going up from the Barclays Center um, where the New York Liberty will be playing tonight. Um, and uh, we formed a coalition called the Racial Impact Study. This is, I'm sorry, this is going to be a little nerdy and wonky and I'm going policy side for a reason um, because ultimately the racial impact study group was able to pass this like really first ever thing called Local Law 78 or um, the Racial Impact Law, which says and has these different components, but in short basically says developers are responsible for analyzing not just their environmental impact or the number of units that they're going to bring online, but the racial and displacement impact of their projects that are going to occur in neighborhoods. This comes, and, and for us this is very important because so often we were talking about this one by one with government and what we were hearing back as community was prove it. They put the burden on us to prove that it was happening and when we didn't necessarily have the data or the evidence or it's qualitative stories, then you get shut down and you get shut out of the conversation. How do you steer and say, we know that people are impacted when everything that's coming into their neighborhood is $3,600 or more rents? This is about the average for a two bedroom as recent, um, for new construction especially, that that has a huge impact on a city where average wise we probably need more like $1,200 based on our population, right? That's a huge gap. So we worked with, as a coalition over quite a long period of time, oftentimes you start out in these conversations and get laughed out the room. Um, there was a long fight and debate over whether we had legal standing to ask for this, um, whether we are allowed to do this. Ultimately, Bill shepherded and stewarded by then city council member, now public advocate Jumani Williams, um, uh, to say, no, we, this, this is about giving people data and information, right? We're not... We're, we are not dictating the outcomes of this, but we are saying that as a part of your development, the same way we will give information about environmental impact, we will give information about displacement risk and, and racial impact. Um, that, that, and so then ultimately it moves into um, work with the agencies, with Department of City Planning, with HPD, to then create these different indices. So you've got um, an equitable development tool, um, which is kind of like this tool where you can go in and there and look, um, I think I've got, yes. So this is like an example of the eddy. So as you get darker in purple, you get higher in terms of what your displacement risk is. Um, and you can go sort of, this is, this is, I think, no, that's not Prospect Park. I was gonna say the top of that is Prospect. Oh, no, that is, that's Prospect Park. That's the um, green block right there, right? So you can kind of get a sense of where, what the displacement risk is in a given area. Um, then there's the displacement risk index. This was one that was quite contentious because everybody always has feelings um, about when you give indices. Um, but that says, like, here is your risk factor. Here are your numbers about um, uh, your rate. And, and I'll come back to why this piece specifically matters. Um, and then racial equity reports, which means that when you do the development, you are required to give these reports to your community board, to your elected officials, who are ultimately the people who are the deciders. So in a sense, we kind of very strategically were like, we are not the deciders, they are the deciders, but everybody has the data, and then we're organizers, so then we push the deciders, right? That's like a little bit of the tactic. That's So I showed you the eddy. Um, why this matters, and I know I'm at time, um, is that ultimately now, for the first time ever, we have a way to consistently bring race and displacement into the conversation of what is getting built anew in the city. And to say that this is something that we have to look at, um, and it is becoming a part of a national conversation, both around racial equity indices, when it comes to city government, we've seen this in budgeting, we've seen this in land use, we've seen this in education, 
Um, but also an understanding that government is often driven by metrics. And if we don't have a way to hold them to a metric or a score, we actually are in a very um, deficit position. That we need a way to say, you've got an F versus this is a C versus this is a B, um, because what this looks like across the city is very different. Um, there are 10 community districts, so think of like, uh, like a neighborhood-ish in New York City, um, that have built less than, not 10,000, 10, one oh, no zeros, um, less than 10 extremely low income units in the past 10 years. They basically have opted out of it entirely, right? So we do need some way to say and to highlight who is doing what and who is not participating in being a part of the solution of addressing displacement and addressing our housing crisis and our homelessness crisis. So, thank you. Thank you, Marika. And next up is Carlos, I guess. Good evening. Um, thank you for the invitation and thank you for being here behind me, some of you. Uh, yeah, um, I'm going to focus a little bit more uh, maybe on spatial things, although I'm going to also mention things related more to the management of, of this type of housing on projects that we are, build, uh, we are building and that we are focusing for the last years, which is basically cooperative housing in Barcelona and around. I speak most of the time as a resident of the, one of these projects, more than designer, because in the, my team, I'm not, I don't have the role of designer. Um, so I happen to live here, which is La Borda. If you know any, if you know one of our projects, probably it's this one. Um, but probably what maybe you haven't seen is all that, what it takes to get there, no? And uh, you might see the final images, which uh, we are not much interested in, on the result, no? We are very much interested in the process, and these processes um, normally are very complex, very long. This one was seven years. We are working with some that now is eight years. Sometimes we also now playing with this uh, right of first refusal or buying existing properties so there we can speed up the process but otherwise it, it can take a lot and it can entail a lot of different decisions very complex and very interconnected no so that's actually where i like uh, the most this relation between the spatial and, and the non-spatial meaning the legal and the economic and the sustainability aspects um First of all, uh, I need to clarify that here we talk about uh, what we call grant of use, cooperative housing. Probably for you, it'll be just cooperative housing and the rest of the world. But in Spain, uh, we live in a country that is very much owner-occupied. 80% is owner-occupied. In cities like Barcelona, it's a little bit more than 60%. Uh, so even housing cooperatives were owner-occupied. They would uh, exist, especially in the 70s, built. Uh, and then sell the apartments to the tenants and became now part of the market. So uh, that's why we have this 1% that uh, Ada Kola was mentioning of social housing. Here we see for us a new uh, model which has been existing el elsewhere for decades. We learn mostly from Uruguay in Latin America and Denmark in, in Europe, uh, but also here or, or Switzerland, Germany. We basically, no, we think we can summarize it no, in this idea of collective ownership of the building. The land can be a different discussion. I, I will mention that at the end. This democratic organization that uh, runs the, the co-op and the transfer only of the right of use of the units. You never, became, you never become the owner or you can never sublet uh, your units. No? So you can only have the right of using it, which for us is the most important, no? as we have been hearing this evening, that the importance is to put the, the right of housing at, at the center. I think it's also important to mention that we understand this as part of a broader policy, uh, no? that maybe not everybody wants to do all this democratic organization, and maybe they only just need uh, this and affordable housing in the rental market or, or run by uh, the government or an, an NGO or whatever. But this is for us new and refreshing and also uh, bringing uh, 
taking control by, by the tenants no? and on this very polarized system that we have in Spain, which is basically either you buy, either you rent, and, and ne nothing else. No? We think it's an interesting model because many points, and I could be here talking for hours, and I will try to uh, keep it on those three, especially the first two. Uh, we first of all think it's an interesting project uh, or model because it's very unique when it comes to collective housing as an architect. Because normally when you have your projects on housing, if it's an individual housing, you have the client there, you have the family, the, the owner who's going to live there. But if you are dealing with collective housing, your client is not your user. It's either a private developer that wants to make as much money as possible, either a public or private institution that uh, deals with uh, rental or, or social housing, and they want as less problems as possible. But they're not the final users, no? And normally, they do, they take decisions based on those parameters and not thinking on the people who want to live there. Here we have groups that are organized, maybe not 100% of the people who's gonna live there, but at least uh, most of them from the very beginning, and we can have the opportunity to discuss with them. And this, we think, has uh, brought us the, the completely different outcomes when you compare the projects that we are doing to the more conventional private or, or public uh, sectors. And the, the involvement of, of users depends on, on the, their will and the capacities and, and whether or not uh, they have some skills, but in the case of Laborda, it has reached up to the self-construction of some parts, and nowadays the maintenance, as uh, it was mentioned in, in Brazil, no? Uh, but also even allowed us to study and, and to learn from our future tenants, no? And learn certain things, as for instance, this is the case of Laborda, 28 units, only one of them was the conventional family that me many developers still have in mind when they produce housing, no? like two parents, two kids. That was only one of 28. The vast majority, and that's the, the reality of uh, households in Spain, was people living alone, people living in couples, elderly people who wanted to live together. No? All this diversity that many times is forgotten or, or out of the, of the market. This peculiarity uh, allowed us to do this like, this reflection of uh, redefining what collective housing means. No, it doesn't have to be just individual units, one on top of each other. It could be way more. No, so what we do is we reflect what we do in houses, which is way more than just sleeping, cooking, and taking a shower. No, there's a lot of things that we rely on housing, and a lot of things that are related to housing that can be also used to change and to transform the way we live. And we discuss with the communities where all they want to put all these activities, no? Has to be solved at the user level, has to be solved at the household, has to be, maybe it can be clustered with some of the households, it can be uh, shared with the whole community, or maybe we don't even need it in the building because it's already present in the neighborhood and we can skip this service or this space. With this, we shift from this more conventional uh, typology or, or way of doing collective housing, which is we try to solve all the needs in the units and leave as less as possible into the corridors, into the elevators, and so on. What we do is we, sh we shift to smaller units, uh, not because we are evil developers trying to squeeze more people in the less <laughs> space as possible, but because there's a lot of things that we see that we can share, we can be more efficient, and actually, we can even have more of that if we uh, do that, no? So there's all these, uh, these surface and all these services that are uh, shared just because people want and they decide collectively what they want to put in common and how much they want to put in common. Why we do that is uh, for many reasons. One is to be more efficient. This might sound obvious to you here in the US context, but in Spain, not having a washing machine inside of your house, it's something uh, like from a movie. Uh, even the, the code requires you to have the space, to have the plumbing, to have everything prepared for having a washing machine at each unit. Even if, like in the case of the projects that we're doing, there's only two, maximum three, uh, industrial washing machines that are shared and work perfectly. 
it's not only about a question of uh, efficiency, it's also a, que a question of um, being more transparent and more uh, thinking on the everyday uses of houses. No? And obviously, there's a lot of projects that share a lot of things, and they were in Spain before, but they used to be swimming pools, paddle courts, all these things, all these leisure activities. Here we are sharing things related to uh, everyday activities, to care activities, and we try to make them as visible as possible, as pleasant as possible, that you can be doing more than one activity at the same time. So we have a lot of terraces where you hang your laundry at the same time that you're playing with your children. We have communal uh, kitchens and, and dining rooms. This is the one from La Borda, the first years. Now there's a little bit more of tables and life. Uh, or this is the one in a second project we did, La Balma, uh, where these spaces become uh, these centers for activities for where communities have communal meals once a week normally, but then you can use this space for yoga, you can use this space for your own birthday parties, you can leave this space for uh, other associations, NGOs in the, in the neighborhood that might need a room for meeting. So all these activities that are many times invisible in the conventional houses. Then the other idea that I, I like very much is this idea of uh, communal luxuries. So all these activities and spaces that I could not afford on my own with my salary, I could not have this space or the, the two guest rooms that host six people that are at the end of the stairs uh, in this picture. But if I, if I have to pay it with my salary in the city of Barcelona, I can have it if I share it with my neighbors. And I only use it once a year for my throwing my party or in the afternoons with my uh, daughter when we play with the other children in, in the, in, from the building. No? But I can have it if I share it with, with others. And it, it's also a more sustainable way uh, to, to access to these resources. Finally, also the, the ground floors of this type of projects Normally, uh, they tend to be commercial, but they tend to be commercial uh, thinking on what the neighborhood needs and bringing opportunities for similar projects. So in this case, for instance, it's a food cop that was already present in the neighborhood and that uh, now has a lower rent in the, in the base of in the, in the ground floor of, of La Borda. And the last uh, idea on rethinking the, the collective housing um, what it means, it also relates to the interior of the units. No? Like we can also, with this model, have units that can evolve, that can host different types of families, different uh, family organizations, and the evolution of this. No? So in all of our projects, we always think, how can the units evolve? How can they transfer, for instance, some of their rooms to other units when they are not needed anymore. This is the case of before you saw La Balma, this is La Borta, but you see you have two minimum units of 40 square meters in each site, and depending whether or not you have one, or two, or zero bedrooms, you have different houses topologies. And these bedrooms are physically and legally thought so that in, very, in less than a week you can change this room that you can see here from one apartment to the other. Um, we're also thinking in, in less hierarchical typologies. No? So you see, always see that we play with rooms with similar sizes, so everybody can decide how they want to lay out their units. And in La Borda, we have 28 units that come from the same matrix, and they are all different because people are organized in a different way, and they have evolved already after five years only. This, you see here different configurations as well. Now in the project that we just started building uh, last month, we are playing with a new uh, typology that we call, or are called clusters, where uh, this idea of communal living is even more present. No? And there's floors where people really have small kitchenettes and they want to share most of the meals together. This is something that was not possible until very recent legal change on the, on the coding for, for housing. This is something that we do as well, no? all this uh, policing uh, and lobbying on changing all the, all the things that don't fit because we are always fighting with uh, all these um, regulations. And this is the last um, bite I wanted to mention, but I, I don't want to focus too much. Obviously, we play a lot 
with bioclimatic design. We play a lot uh, with bringing back traditional easy measures to play with, uh, with um, climate control. Uh, this is, for instance, uh, the, this patio brings the uh, typology of social housing in the center and south of Spain called Corrala. Uh, and this is the most high tech that you will see in our buildings, which is, comes from agriculture, so it's actually not super high tech. Uh, but it's the only thing that goes automatically. Our idea of sustainability relies a lot on learning and training and discussing with people how they should use properly the units so that they function well, so that they don't end up installing AC because they don't know how to work with their, how, how their units work, no? This way we managed to tackle situations of energy poverty. This was a situation of energy poverty before the people moved to, to La Borda. So we have one fourth of people who were in energy poverty before. And now we have people who pay less than half of the average of their neighbors in terms of energy and staying in the same uh, level of comfort. We also save, uh, our idea of environment relies on saving, on saving things that we don't need. So we manage also to change a regulation that for, was forcing us to build, well, we, I mean, we together with the political parties <laughs> like Ada Colaus, uh, to change um, this regulation that forced us to build uh, underground parking for every new unit. O although we knew that people who was going to live there had no cars or were already had a parking spot in the area. This way, we also managed to convince them uh, to rely on more sustainable uh, materials and so on. And I just wanted to finish with some how this continued. No? La Borda was kind of an experiment for everybody, also for the municipality. But now this has become, even if it's a very recent trend, has become a success. It's still a drop in the sea, but it's been growing uh, enormously, especially in Barcelona and in the region of, of Catalonia. We started uh, with these two cases, La Borda and uh, um, Sostra Civic in the city center, Princesa. Now we are with 19 projects, 16 of them in public land, uh, th especially thanks to uh, this uh, agreement that was created by the municipality with the Federation of Cooper Housing Cooperatives in order to secure that there are leaseholds of uh, land to cooperative housing to produce social housing. I think it's very important to stress that all these projects that we are seeing, if they don't get uh, public support by, uh, with policies and with funding, with uh, public loans, everything, they will end up being elitist. No? They will be, end up being co-housing, co-living, that is just for few. Uh, but we have proven, and we've seen, in, especially in Uruguay, no, that if there is this joint forces with this third sector and the public government, we can secure housing for decades and we can make it in, to the people who need it uh, the most. And I will leave it here because the flag is there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And thank you all for these incredible presentations. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're going to combine the, the sort of four respondents and, and then we can take the, the, the questions. So maybe let's start with, with Hillary um, on the right. Um, I think there's a mic coming your way. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Thank you for your presentations. Um, some of the questions I had you sort of answered or at least touched on, like maintenance and housing um, is one of my <laughs> favorite topics. Um, so I would be happy to hear more about that from each of you in particular instances where you find cases that are successful. And um, I think I'm thinking mostly of, let's say, instances here in New York around superintendents, because I feel this is often one category that's left out of the conversation. Um, and the other question I had would be around um, density and scale, and if you see particular cases that are most um, uh, useful, I think maybe would be the question, because this is always the question. In New York, while we're a city of skyscrapers, our largest landmass is actually only about two stories tall. So, thank you. Adam, please. I had um, written a response beforehand, as I was told to do, but 
None of those responses are relevant. So I'm um, going to invent here a little bit. And I had actually written density and scale on my little notebook. I don't know if you were looking over. Um, one of the things that I um, have heard a few times is this question of public land and uh, the ability to do more on public land and trying to flip the script between public and private. And um, I suppose it's always dangerous to offer ideas um, without having fully thought them through. But uh, certainly in New York, the projects that have 100% affordable housing being built on them today are occurring on public land. So there becomes a question about how uh, the public may acquire more land. And we tend to do things a little bit backwards here in New York where we decide to rezone an area at a higher density and, uh, and allow it to become residential. Um, and that occurs after a very lengthy process. And during that time, all of the property owners realize that they should raise their land values, which makes it more and more difficult to do things. And so the question really is about how do you acquire land? How does the public acquire land? And then you can change the use and increase the density and scale of production of housing. So I think the easiest uh, person to direct that question to, to would be a former mayor, although I could also direct that to the New Yorker in the room. Um, but we have many instances here in New York where um, we are expecting changes um, to an area that may be low density or uh, manufacturing land that's not heavily used. How could uh, the public sector acquire land before all those land values go through the roof. Thanks, Adam. Tom, please. Okay, just uh, thank you so much for the for coming here for the presentations. Uh, it's really inspiring stuff, and I just aluta continua, just just wonderful. Um, so I've got uh, just one quick reaction, and I hope you're just going to ask for your indulgence for a second while I quote the late great Peter Marcuse, who used to be here at GSAP. Uh, he once wrote with David Madden in a book called In Defense of Housing, and here's the quote. The idea of crisis implies that inadequate or unaffordable housing is abnormal, a temporary departure from a well-functioning standard. But for working class and poor communities, housing crisis is the norm. For the oppressed, housing is always in crisis. And then they continued in the book, housing crisis is not a result of the system breaking down, but of the system working as it intended. So I very much appreciate the focus on systemic issues that we heard from each one of the presenters here. Um, also, it's so refreshing to, to be in a, a, an academic setting on housing where we're talking about use values. And I very much appreciated your summary of those. My question is actually about, um, is asked as a social scientist who does qualitative research and teaches about qualitative methods. One of the things that I've struggled with is getting powerful people to take qualitative evidence seriously. Usually it's dismissed as anecdotal, not even as data. And Bariku, when you were talking about, you know, like people were saying to you, show me the evidence, they meant numbers. And then we had this incredibly powerful concluding remark from Ada about cities need citizens. And we also had your quotation from somebody who'd been evicted. And, you know, there's so much evidence to show, you know, we know this is happening, we know what's going on here. I mean, I've many times been dismissed as ideological and anecdotal simply for presenting similar quotations. So I'd love to know from all four of you, uh, and we can continue the conversation later, what do we do about this problem of, uh, of, of powerful evidence being dismissed by powerful people? So that's my question. Thank you. Juan, please. Yeah. OK. Um, thank you for the presentations. I'm repeating the same than my colleagues, but I think they have been uh, quite interesting because it's a demonstration that another policies are possible. Things to do. Uh, my question is about 
the importance of research, multidisciplinarity, and innovation. I have uh, noticed that there is a common uh, ingredient of, of the presentations uh, about collecting the data that give us the real dimension of the problems, and not from a paternalistic uh, attitude, but as a real effort to understand in the deepness no, of, the, of the questions to, to demonstrate that it's not impossible to do, uh, to find the solutions. Multidisciplinarity, because I have also observed that you are involved with many other people and many other disciplines, and architects, of course, are important in, in that list of uh, expertise. And innovation, because in the cases we have seen here today, there are a lot of inventions in, in terms of the design, and I want to underline this word, the design of the strategies, no? the, the, how to do that. No? I'm thinking in the uh, Metropolitan Observatory of Housing in Barcelona, no? where so many people have been working these eight years uh, trying to, to, to find what can we do and how to do it. And I think it's the, one of the origins of what you have done in, in, your, in your eight years at the head of the municipality. But in the other cases, I think all, also there are these ingredients. So um, multidisciplinarity, research, and innovation. That's the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe we can start with the question, Adam's question about more land, which seemed Mostly directed to Ada, like how do we get more land rather than just protecting the existing communal land? How do we acquire more? Okay, but I need to um, to help with translation. Can you help me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, porque pregunta por cómo crear más más tierra urbana, ¿no? Que es el problema de todas las ciudades, ¿no? Esa es la pregunta. Incre sin incrementar precio, incluso altura, porque En Barcelona es un debate si incrementar la altura de los edificios y la tendencia mayoritaria es que no, porque somos una ciudad mediterránea, ¿no? que sería una posibilidad. So how to, the question is how to multiply land uh, without uh, uh, expanding being a Mediterranean city, right? And, uh, and that's la altura de los edificios. Height, uh, in, in the case of Barcelona. En, y Barcelona es más difícil que otras ciudades porque es una de las ciudades más densas de Europa. Está entre la montaña y el mar. En Barcelona es even more difficult because it's already one of the densest uh, cities in Europe, being very constrained in between the mountain and the sea. Entonces, una primera cuestión es que nosotros hemos uh, empezado a hacer una estrategia de alianza con las otras ciudades metropolitanas, aunque no está prevista por la ley. So one first strategy is that, that we did is actually uh, to build alliances with the cities that are surrounding Barcelona, even though that's not allowed by the law. La visión no puede ser solo municipal. La visión tiene que ser de región metropolitana. ¿no? En transporte público, vivienda, en equipamientos en general. La, visión, la ciudad real es de región, aunque legalmente no esté reconocida. Sí. Uh, the vision needs to be regional. Uh, rather than, than city uh, scale. And that means in terms of transportation and mobility, equip, uh, uh, infrastructures and mm -hmm. housing, even though that's not promoted by the legal frame. Sin embargo, a pesar de que el, la cuestión regional es importante, podemos hacer muchas cosas para recuperar land en Barcelona también. Por ejemplo, um, Una estrategia ha sido la que he comentado del tanteo retracto, que no sé cómo se dice en inglés. So still, there's many things that can be done at the scale of the city or at the, at the, at the level of the city. For instance, one of them was this, uh, to, to, uh, to increase the, the amount of available land. And one of them, for instance, was this uh, regulation of the right to re reclaim land to bring it back to the o sea, public cada vez domain. Que se, cada vez que se vende un edificio en Barcelona, nosotros hemos hecho una nueva regulación urbana y cada vez que un privado vende un edificio, tenemos el derecho de compra preferente. So it was regulated uh, through uh, uh, Ada Colau's uh, government 
that whenever a building was put in the market, the, the city had the, the right to, to be the first one uh, uh, offering, like, like uh, uh, trying to buy it, right? Or having the right to buy it. Esto tiene muchas ventajas porque permite comprar edificios ya construidos, o sea que es rápido, ¿no? porque necesitamos edificios construidos. Además, en lugares céntricos, donde no tenemos mm, eh, tierra ¿no? urbana de la municipalidad. Eh, por lo tanto, recuperamos tierra urbana para lo público, en lugares céntricos, con edificios ya construidos y además impedimos especulación porque muchas de las operaciones inmobiliarias sabemos que se hacen con dinero en negro. O sea, hay un precio oficial en A y un precio no oficial en B. Cuando compra el ayuntamiento solo paga el precio oficial. Entonces disminuimos la especulación en la ciudad. So this was very, actually very effective because it allowed to do three things. The first is to... Uh, by buildings that were already built, so that speed up the capacity of the city to react. The second is that these buildings could be in central locations where there's normally no public land, and therefore it expanded the capacity of the city to operate in, in central parts of the city. And the third is that being these buildings marketed under value so that they could benefit from uh, laundering money dynamics, uh, the city would end up having a very favorable price, right? And that was a way to confront speculation. Yes. Y, y otra estrategia de, de, urbaniza, de planificación urbanística que hemos utilizado, que, que también creo que existe en Londres, en París, es eh, el 30%. Obligar a que cada vez que un privado construye un edificio nuevo, el 30% de esos apartamentos tienen que ser a un precio que no es social housing, pero tampoco es free market, es intermedio, ¿no? And the, the other thing that they did is to impose the 30% uh, uh, requi requirement that basically is already happening in London, in Paris, right? Mm -hmm. And that it imposed that any developer doing a housing building, uh, it's obliged to put 30% of the apartments uh, at a price that is uh, controlled, that is not social housing, neither market price, but something in between. Entonces son muchas estrategias para recuperar el máximo de vivienda. O por ejemplo también cuando hemos cerrado miles de apartamentos turísticos y hemos confrontado con Airbnb, esos apartamentos turísticos han pasado a ser apartamentos residenciales y hemos ganado 8.000 apartamentos residenciales con una nueva norma urbanística. So the, the impact came not through one single strategy, but a number of strategies that were combined. And the, the last one that, that uh, she wants to mention is also the regulation of uh, tourist apartments that allowed to uh, remove 8,000 apartments from, the, from Airbnb and other similar systems that were brought back to the, to the housing stock of the city. Maybe this quantitative moment is a good bridge to, to the question, um, which is Tom's question, which I wanted to pose um, uh, to you, Barika. Tom's question basically about um, uh, powerful evidence being dismissed by powerful people. How do you deal <laughs> with that? Um, I mean, I think, Tom, I wish I had an answer, um, is the first thing. <laughs> um, we have not cracked this, and I, I think if anything, um, what is incredibly frustrating about this is that time and time again, the quantitative data lags behind the qualitative data, but people don't listen to it, right? So um, here in the US, for decades, there was qualitative data and evidence that families of color said that their homes were not being assessed at the same values as other folks, right? People were like, it's in your head, it's not real, that's, oh, well, it's because your individual house, it was all written off as individual circumstances, one-off stories, it wasn't real, until ultimately our quantitative data is only as good as our quantitative data sets. And there are lots of things that is incredibly hard to collect as numerical data because they're so intersectional, right? Um, and so it took a long time for the data to be able to catch up with the lived experience, to then be able to show that actually um, uh, uh, 
uh, disparities in house assessments are widespread. Now you've got a task force led by the HUD secretary at the highest federal government level. So I think this is a place that we very much struggle. Um, we still, to this day, are having fights with people within our own housing community who consistently say increased home values don't have a secondary displacement impact on anybody around them, mm. right? And I was like, I get that your data numbers say that because I'm a data wonk and I know that you're great at data and I don't question that your data sets are concluding that and also your data sets are very limited, right? I don't have a way to collect and quantify the fact that as the neighborhood changes, the two little twin boys a couple blocks down from me um, get harassed by the police completely differently than they did when we were a neighborhood that was mainly people of color and lower income. That changes their experience in the neighborhood, that changes if their parents wanna stay, that changes their experience in schools, our grocery stores change. One of the best social experiments that somebody should have is looking at how bodegas change as neighborhoods gentrify. Because you can tell when a neighborhood in New York City flips based on when a bodega starts stocking oat milk and almond milk and pita chips and right when that's like, then it's like, all right, we're, on, we're, we're now on to phase three, right? They know, right? But somehow that is not something, I, I don't have a registry of what they are stocking in their bodega and grocery store, um, but that changes how people can operate in a neighborhood. In my neighborhood, people use the bodega on credit. So that sounds weird, but your kid can come in after school and get something at the bodega, and the bodega owner has known the family for such a long time that they know mom or dad is gonna come by later on or grandma's gonna come by two days later and clear out the debt. That does not work anymore when you break down those social um, just, um, barriers, and I will, I will say, cite a data piece of this, um, which is where I get into fights with some of our fellow housers, um, which is that we get a lot of conversations about mixed income housing and moving to opportunity, which is this like moving to taking people from low income communities into higher income communities, and isn't this great? And like, look at all the, and there are pieces of it that are great, but having been a young researcher who'd worked a lot on MTO, if you dig into the numbers of that data, there is one classification that shows consistent high performance, and that is young girls. Young girls, then you get young boys, then you get teenage girls, almost nothing for teenage boys and nothing for parents, right? And so it does show, sort of show you that ultimately like the bumps in what you see for that are most experienced when you're in your youth years um, and can access and build different social fabrics. But for the parent who had unofficial childcare with somebody down the street and now is on the Upper East Side and unofficial childcare doesn't exist, you've now put them in a very difficult situation, right? We don't have good ways to quantify this. And I think it's actually our, for all of our um, very thoughtful social justice conversations and even our, some of our more left or progressive leaders, um, even they oftentimes will not believe what people's lived experience is until we have gotten to a point of catching up and often then for some many communities it's too late. It's very frustrating. Thank you, very kind. Um, next, uh, maybe um, Hillary's question I think is obvious for, for, for Renato on, on maintenance and the question of superintendents, maybe you can expand a bit on that and also the question of density and skill, how that plays into the role of FICA. And before that I also want to Ask if there's any questions from the audience, please collect them and think, ra raise your hands already because I'm gonna combine those as well later. But first, um, Renato, so the question of, of superintendents in relation to maintenance and the question of skill and density. Okay, uh, I have nothing to say about density, uh, at least uh, concerning our work, but uh, we have a lot to say about uh, maintenance. Uh, we think that we have uh, cracked the code of uh, making a self-management of a building without the need of a superintendence. This is based upon 
distribution of tasks. Distribution, uh, each uh, of our tenants uh, knows the task that he or she is doing. We have a complaints form that has never been used. We uh, have detailed uh, all the very, very small steps of maintenance, like pick, the, pick up the bucket there and sweep that way. We have uh, uh, syst systematized it. We have put this uh, uh, on uh, paper so that everybody knows what he or she has to do. Uh, people are happy in our building. People don't need to make endless boring uh, meetings about it. And uh, the system is able to self-improve uh, itself. We avoided assemblyism. Uh, we do assemblies every now and then, but uh, everybody knows his or her responsibility. If it's shared responsibility, someone is always responsible. That way, we can avoid to have a quite complex building, 20 uh, housing units, of which 15 are inhabited right now, uh, without the need of super, a superintendent. This would be quite expensive. I can give you the details of uh, how uh, we did this. But we are quite happy about uh, the uh, solutions that we had. If I may something about, say something about uh, government and poor people, <laughs> poor, powerful people's uh, um, power. We thank every day that uh, we decided nine years ago not to depend upon government. We are offering solutions for government, but we don't depend on uh, government. And this, we, this makes us feel very good because you don't desire power of, the power that you don't have. And I really like uh, this experience. And this is absolutely not a neoliberal anti-government uh, talk. We would love government to like uh, support and subsidize us. We are just not waiting that government does it. I really like this path. Thank you, Renato. And, and then um, the, the question from Juan, of course, to the cooperative um, uh, member here, I think, is, is the importance of, of research, uh, multidisciplinarity, um, and innovation in, in your work. Yeah. yeah, in our case, it was crucial to team with um, economists and lawyers to do all this knowledge transfer from uh, other countries that had done similar experience previously and try to transfer them to our, our context. No? And this work is still going on and, and, and we are like, a, like one team when it comes to every new project that comes to us. Uh, we, do, we do all this research and all this um, project uh, design all together with the different professionals. I am also thinking on, we are incorporated in our office the last three years, I think, we have a team of uh, what we call in Spain technical architects, so it's professionals more trained on the construction, and this team only uh, helps these groups to control the construction, because suddenly you have a group of people who has never done even the renovation of a bathroom, managing five million euro project uh, for doing their house, and they need support on that and, and we hired these uh, technical architects to help them doing all this process. And related to the, to the question of Tom on the qualitative re research, um, we also team up the last years with the Public Health Inst Agency of Barcelona, who is doing a research for many years now, uh, studying the effects on health on people who move to this project, so they study them before and they study them after, and they've been already starting to publish the first results, um, mostly qualitative. And for us, it's very important to support all this lobbying that we do when we go to discuss with governments, no? because then we have this evidence and we have been using this evidence uh, that in many ways are very touching and very effective because we can show mm, Mm, specific and, and more generic uh, results on people using less drugs, uh, going less to the doctor, feeling less lonely, uh, on, on real effects, on real problems that the city has when we are working with housing, but related to health. No? So definitely, I think it's, it's something that we incorporate one way or, or another. Thank you, Carlos. Um, any questions from the audience? Can I see? There's, okay, I'm going to 
collect them, I see three, four. So one, two, let's, Amy, let's start on here, on this side, yeah. So one, two, three, and four. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for the presentation. They were really inspiring. Um, I'm a PhD student from Spain, and I'm actually analyzing how sustainable art collaborative architecture, and I'm comparing this co-housing model uh, against co-living model, because now the market, they are like blurry and limits, and the definition is so clear, and it's really the opposite, and they are causing uh, gentrification and against, against regeneration, which does co-living does. So my question is, now in, in Barcelona, um, are you contemplating uh, regulations to control or just to limit this co-living um, issue? Because uh, at the end, co-living is becoming like a huge Airbnb, and, and this co-living um, model is uh, hosting digital nomads and these new tourists, let's say, with a different state, let's say it's an intermediate state, and, and I don't know if you are uh, contemplating the, the effect, in the negative effect in, in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take the second where we'll compile all the questions again. So the second one is right there, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, here with the gray shirt, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I, 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 I like the, the comment about sweat equity, as we call it, like uh, people managing their buildings themselves and not having a super, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, that's how we do it in my building. My building that I live in is a former squat turned into social housing on the Lower East Side. Um, and I think that gets left out of the conversation a lot. We talk about buildings and cities for people, but we don't talk about the fact that people actually have to run and manage their social housing to make it, um, in fact, democratic and social. Um, it's something we struggle with um, in the community land trust. I'm involved in Cooper Square, who's a member um, of NHD. Um, we say, you know, it took 50 years for us to win the buildings, and then that's really when the struggle started, because now we have to keep them and keep them maintained. And I just wanted to also touch on this question of public land and how do we get land in the center especially, I think we need to learn from history and directly confront the state and directly confront the real estate industry and you know, think more radically, especially when we talk about scaling up of, uh, yeah, you know, rent strikes, squatting when, when it works, um, uh, just challenging this question of property rights more directly and I think more aggressively um, because, you know, I, I just don't think that certain policies can, can fully scale up. We actually do have the right of first refusal um, at the, both the city and state level pending as bills that we're organizing around. Um, and it's really hard because there's so much, so much opposition, even just to passing rental protections that we got this year, good cause, it got so watered down that the, the tenant movement was... Let's get to the question okay. also. The, I, I, I just, yeah. I, yeah, I'm just, I guess, wondering if anyone wants to talk about more directly confronting the state and, and forcing a, a crisis in some way rather than trying to pass some, some small regulations or, or bills that will slightly move the needle. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Santos, in the end, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. My question is on the notion of city, where city segregates uh, living and working. So can housing crisis uh, be rethought where housing can exist with other uh, civic or workspaces? Or considering how the uh, volatile the market is, should we design uh, malls or markets or civic spaces considering that one day it be, can be converted into housing? Is that the way to think about housing? not look only at housing stock and thinking about housing in all, all other You're typologies. You're talking about tra the transformation of existing malls and civic spaces into housing. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. And then the last question in the back. Yeah, so I wanted to thank everyone. It was very inspiring and insightful on many different levels, levels of which I can't even enumerate in one conversation. 
Um, but my basic question is, um, well, actually a comment first to thank the mayor of Barcelona very much for recognizing that cities are comprised of people and citizens. That's so breathtaking. I've never heard um, anyone in power, let alone a woman, state that. And with that in mind, um, from New York, um, when you get an apartment, it's not often that the rent stays at that certain level that you've entered. So I'm curious in all of your projects, how long does a renter or an owner or whatever the terminology that describes the person that is within the module that you've created for a habitation, how long do they stay at that rental amount level? before it is changed, either by policy or culture or addition to the family or some other caveat that has yet to be named or fees associated with by the developer or what have you. I hope I've made that clear and encompassing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we have these the, the four questions. Maybe we can uh, start with the confront Confronting the state, is there anyone both <laughs> from the, not from the state, but municipality, <laughs> let's say, um, anyone who wants to, maybe Carlos, this is an interesting one for you, like yeah. how do you confront the state? No, I was thinking, connecting the um, two questions there, no, on how to get more land and uh, how mm -hmm. to, yeah, and similar to the fellow Spanish on the, <laughs> how, uh, how to tackle the different developers, you know? Because I think it's important that when we make regulations, I think, for instance, now we live in, in a country of owner-occupied uh, units because for decades since the dictatorship, all the policies were pushing people to do that. It's not natural. It wasn't like that before the 40s. Um, and all the measures, all the subsidies went to for, for helping to... That is, I mean, I don't blame my friends who bought a house. That was the easiest and the smartest thing to do, but for them and not for the society. So I think we really need a shift where, uh, obviously, I, I would vote for a more revolutionary getting that all the land is public, for instance, uh, but maybe something more, pos more possible is really to put a lot of um, pressures you know, on, on the profit from the private sector, not like the 30% measures and so on, really, really limiting and really making things complicated for those who want to make profit out of housing and really, really, really favor those who want to uh, use housing properly you know, and, and help them thrive. Because it's true that we have very, very limited um, public land to do any kind of project in, in the Spanish cities. But there's been precedents for one measure that we look very much is in the Netherlands. I'm sorry, in Denmark, in the 70s, there, there was a law that um, allowed tenants to organize, and if more than 50% of the tenants agree, they had the right to buy the building and turn it into a co-op. And it, it was a fixed price by the government. It was not free market price. No, and it was subsidized, and, and it was helped. They, they got a lot of a lot of support, and because of that, now they have 30% of cooperative housing in in Denmark. So I think we should. We, there's ways that we can we can make it if we favor those who need it and we limit those who shouldn't be playing with our houses. Thank you. Um, maybe Renato, the question on how long do you stay at the rental level to transport the New York experience to Sao Paulo? Like uh, in our project, uh, we have uh, three different ways of uh, answering the question. It depends on what we call the program. This house that I showed you is a student house. Uh, people can stay there in the house as long as they are ready with, ready with their uh, diploma. So it's structurally temporary. Then we have this program of apartments in which we try to show the society that social property, uh, common property, is a possibility, that it's viable, that we can maintain it well, that people can be happy and without being owners. In these apartments, people can stay forever, well, how, uh, the amount of time that uh, 
they want. And then we have another program, which is a housing first uh, program. People pay no rent. We are still testing it so that we expect that one day people get autonomy and they can pay at least for their like, energy bills or pay a little bit of uh, rent for their maintenance. But uh, we thought we would uh, reach this point quite quickly and we understand that people need years to de-stress from like homeless situation. And, but in that case, we will be patient. As long as our uh, institution can uh, stand it, we will keep people there uh, without paying rent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have two minutes left, so we should really be closing. Uh, we, we can close here. Do you want to? Do you want to have? Do you have any last? Um, any last words? So I'll I'll try to run through really quickly. Mm -hmm. One note on the um, to your question on keeping rent stable, I would just highlight also that even this becomes a maintenance or what we say preservation here in New York City question, because at the same time that our incomes aren't rising, the cost even for your social housing operation of the building is rising and increasing. And so what do you do when the cost to like run the building keeps going up? We, as, as ANHD with our members, are struggling with the fact that like they don't want to raise their rents on these tenants that they see. They help their kids. They, they are, right? But like, what do you do? Because we have some folks who are dangerously close to not being able to hold on to the affordable buildings because they're not making payments, because they're not collecting and increasing rents would be, is a problem. Um, I love your fixed price by government, not by free market, on what we call tenant opportunity to purchase. I will note, I did a topo deal years ago in DC. I believe that we are not allowed to do that in the US. Um, so some students should go chase that down and figure out if I'm wrong. Um, but we struggle with um, the fact that uh, one of the strongest parts of our constitution, not city or state governments, this is not necessarily a state fight, constitution fight is property rights. Um, uh, um, and then I, I would say on public land, um, this is one where it's not, it, I think this comes down to like organizing and power building um, because we use the power to seize for public land when we want it for something that is an attractive deal, i.e. for a stadium, i.e. Hudson Yards, i.e. right, we will execute it then, but when we would want that land for affordable housing or somebody asked about combining things. We have some new projects that are combining former libraries with affordable housing on top. Um, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we can't do that. That's so complicated. Um, that's one of the most complex deals it took years um, in order to do and execute. Um, so some of this ultimately comes down to, to political will um, and, and really power building. Thank you. I think. We can close it here. All right. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone.